Well, good morning to you guys that are here. As Judy said, you're the champions of Sunday morning. You got here an hour early. Way to go. Those of you that are watching online, welcome this morning. So by now, I'm sure that you know, um, it was about a year ago this week, wasn't it, that everything kind of shifted. It was a year ago, and we were sitting on the edge of something. We didn't really know how big this thing was going to be, and here we are a year later. I think it's kind of neat, too. Just to think about, you know, this is springtime here, like flowers are opening back up. Like we know this is fake spring because we're from Ohio, right? We've got like another thing coming. This is like, but like there is this sense of, wow, things are kind of coming back, aren't they? Right? Can't wait till things get back to normal. Huh. And I, I want things to get back to normal. Kinda, but not really. If I could be honest with you. I don't really want to get back to normal. I want to get back to better. And I don't mean that as like some corny cliche or anything. I've, I've learned a lot this last year. God's taught me a lot about myself, about my friends, about my family, about our church. He's taught me a lot about him. And I don't want to leave all those lessons that I learned there. I kind of want to bring him into whatever he has around the corner for us, Right? I don't think I'm alone in that. In listening and talking to so many of you over this last year, it seems like that's kind of the same thing. We, we don't want to get back to normal. We want to get back to better. What does that mean? What does that look like? You know, we want to believe that the church is still a viable player in our culture. Don't you want to believe that? We want to believe that God is still good and capable of doing amazing things. We want to believe that there is still a gospel flame flickering in this atmosphere of ash. We're ready to see light at the edges pushing back against the darkness. We've learned too much, we've seen too much, we've sacrificed too much just to turn the page and get back to normal. I don't want to get back to normal, I want to get back to better. So this morning, we're starting a a three-week teaching series that's going to lead us right up to Easter called Awakening. And yeah, I'm aware of the deep irony of starting a series called Awakening on the first Sunday of Daylight Savings Time. So there's that. But here's where we're going to go. The question that's on my mind, and maybe you feel this sometimes, is why don't we see real revival in our lives? I mean, really, like personally, not like big tents and stuff like that, just personally in our own lives. Why do we struggle to see real revival? Why do we keep banging our heads against the wall without ever breaking through? Why does sin and darkness and discouragement so often seem to have the final word? Well, this morning we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, this fairly dusty part of the Old Testament. And we're going to walk the path of a people who felt the exact same way. Ready for new, eager for better. And what they found there in the darkness of disbelief is exactly what I believe we need to hear today. But before we get there, we got to find our footing in, in Second Chronicles because Second Chronicles is this rarely visited corner of the Old Testament and so we got to figure out where we are. So a few questions just to sort of set the context. So, First off, what is Chronicles and why are there two of them? Okay, so a little bit of background for you. First and Second Chronicles, the books that we have, were originally one book. And they were divided up for reasons that we'll get to later. In fact, we're doing a series later this spring um, called Back to Basics, where we talk about where we uh, got the versions of our Bible. How do we get the chapters and the verses and the names and all that stuff? So we'll get there. But for now, you need to know that First and Second Chronicles were originally one book. And they were written in Hebrew. And the Hebrew name of the book was the events of the days, literally. That's what it means, the events of the days. And this is a history book. So that's why there's two of them. What you also want to know about is, well, who wrote these things? Well, we don't know for sure. There's lots of theories out there. Most probable it's Ezra. But what we really ought to think about is that whoever wrote First and Second Chronicles. Don't think of them more. Don't think of them as an author. Think about them like a chronicler or a compiler. Okay, this is somebody who was like almost like a curator at a museum. They took all these scenes from the lives of God's people in this time period, and they arranged them in such a way that we would get something out of it. 
This isn't just running videotape of the past. There is this story, this thread, this push underneath it that we're going to get to in just a second. So the last question we need to ask before we get into it is, why was it written? So for this, I'm going to ask you to help me out. So a little audience participation. Fill in the rest of this quote for me. Those who don't learn from the past are doomed to... There you go. You got that. Those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. And so... As Ezra, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or whoever the chronicler was, sat about to select scenes and write through what God's people needed to hear, there's this underlying truth underneath all of it, and here it is. Don't do what God's people used to do, but realize that God never gives up on you. No matter what. There's some dark stuff in these historical books. But God never gives up on his people. Even when we chase after terrible things, even when we give our hearts over to other gods, even when we've given him every reason not to, he never gives up on us. He's always faithful. He's always good. There's grace greater than sin. There's mercy deeper than my selfishness. There is restoration beyond rebellion. And so these historical books aren't these dusty narratives in the past. They're a testimony to God's goodness. So toward the end of 2 Chronicles, where we'll be this morning, we're going to get a really powerful picture of exactly what that looks like. So it's 640 BC. God's people have lived on their own terms for more than 50 years. They've pushed God to the margin, say, this is how we're going to do things. They've had a series of kings who have led them away from the Lord, away from what God wants for them. And as the curtain goes up on 2 Chronicles 34, we meet our main character, an eight-year-old boy, who's about to discover something that's been lost, recover something that's been long forgotten, and remind God's people about a God who never, ever gives up on them. So scene one, take a look at 2 Chronicles 34. We're going to take a look at verses 1 through 7. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 21 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of David his father. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim and the carved and metal images. All that is just idolatry. And they chopped down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and he cut down the incense altars that stood above them. He broke in pieces the Asherim and the carved and metal images. He made dust of them, scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem, the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and all their ruins around. He broke down the altars. He beat the Asherim and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. So first things first, a third grader is running the country and this is what happens. In all seriousness, he probably had a group of advisors, godly men and women who were helping him out as an eight-year-old king. But even with that in place, Josiah is, let's say, an active young man. And the writer gives us this little commentary right there at the end of verse 2 where he says, he did this just like David did. Now that's the writer of Chronicles giving us a clue. Whenever the writer of Chronicles uses the word like David or after his father David, that's a sign of his faithfulness. Right? That would be like saying, man, this guy was just as courageous as George Washington or just as resolute and principled as Abraham Lincoln. Like When you start talking like that, okay, that means something. They're not just an ordinary leader. That's what David's name means in this context. Well, why? What did Josiah do? Well, you need to know there's about an eight-year gap between verses 2 and verse 3. And so when we pick things up in verse 3, Josiah is just old enough to get his driver's license. In the eighth year of his reign, he's 16, and he does three really notable things that we want to get right out of the gate. These add color to his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather David's legacy. 
First thing he does, right in verse 3, it says he sought the Lord for four years before he did anything. So stop. That's remarkable. This is a 16-year-old kid who, as the first major move of his leadership, decides to seek the Lord for four years. 16 to 20. Think about what I was doing when I was 16 to 20, and it wasn't that. But this is what Josiah is about, and it paves the way for what we're going to see. The second thing that he does is at age 20, okay, after four years of seeking God, now the visible work starts. And all the way through verse 7, Josiah goes on a rampage. And you pick that up. Just take a look at the action verbs here where he says he purged, he chopped down, he cut down, he broke to pieces, he made dust of them, he burned the bones, broke down, beat images into powder, then he returned to Jerusalem. I get this picture of like this kid just walking around with a sledgehammer and a wrecking crew. And there's sweat dripping down his face, this cloud of dust following him as all these idols come crashing down. It's quite a picture. But then the third thing we need to see is 20-year-old Josiah's rampage is laser-focused on one idea, holy rage. Here's what happened. Josiah's dad, Ammon, and his grandpa, a guy named Manasseh, were terrible kings. And under their leadership, God's people forgot who they were. They forgot that they were God's people, and they ought to live differently. So Manasseh, Josiah's grandpa, and Ammon, Josiah's dad, built altars to pagan gods, these little statues that were peppered kind of all throughout the kingdom. The most prominent one was called Asherah. Manasseh actually sacrificed two of his sons to Asherah. It's pretty dark and twisted stuff. Now, how many of you have ever done demo work at your house. You ever knock down a wall? Right? That's a ton of fun, isn't it? Right? Demo day if you watch HGTV. We live for this kind of stuff. I remember when I was 10, helping my dad rip out our bathroom in our upstairs of our house at Greentown, right? And I got to swing the sledgehammer for the first time. It was great. Like we got dust everywhere. There's like chips of like bathtubs and sinks going everywhere. At one point we dropped the sink out of the second story window. And I'm like a 10 year old. I'm like, this is the best day of my life. Demo day is a lot of fun. Here's the point. Sometimes in order to see what could be, you've got to get rid of what is. Hang on to that idea for a few minutes. So that's scene one. A 20-year-old king with a sledgehammer and a wrecking crew. Now scene two. Josiah is 26 years old at this point, six straight years of demo day, dumpsters all over Judah, but now the dust has settled, the dark memories of the past are going to be hauled away, and he's about to take all of that energy and pour it into one massive renovation project. And like any project, Josiah needs two things. He needs money to pay for it, and he needs people to get it done. Take a look in verse 8. Now we get some great names here, so buckle up. Verse 8, now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the governor of Judah, not that Messiah, and Joah, the son of Jehoaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. He came to Hilkiah, the high priest, gave him the money that had been brought into the house of God which the Levites, the keepers of the threshold, had collected from Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnant of Israel and from all of Judah and Benjamin and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So they get this big pile of money. What do they do? They give it to the workmen who are working in the house of the Lord. And all the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord gave it for repairing and restoring the house. They gave it to the carpenters and the builders to buy quarried stone and timber for the... Binders and beams for the buildings that the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. And the men did the work faithfully. Here's some great names. Here we go. Over them were said Jehath and Obadiah, the Levites, sons of Merari and Zechariah. 
Here you go. And Meshalam, son of the Korites, to have oversight. The Levites, who were skillful with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and directed all who did work with every kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes and officials and gatekeepers. So, Josiah's got the money secured. No problem. He's got people working. He's a great leader, right? He's given all this work away. Nothing to worry about. They're doing it. And they're chugging along, working away. The mention of hauling stones from a quarry and carpenters building beams give us an extent to the, to the neglect that had happened. It's kind of a clue. This building hadn't been touched in a long time. This isn't slapping down a new roll of carpet and painting the walls and hanging a few pictures from Walmart. <laughs> this is a full-on, down-to-the-studs gutting of God's house. And that makes sense because Josiah's dad and his grandpa reigned for a combined total of 57 years. 57 years of neglect. And God's house had become like that spooky old house at the end of your cul-de-sac that nobody really knows what's the deal. (laughs) Think about where you were 57 years ago. It was 1964. The Beatles had just appeared appeared on Ed Sullivan. LBJ was just sworn in. Gas was 30 cents a gallon. The average household income was $6,000 a year. And the Surgeon General had just made the fascinating discovery that smoking may be harmful for you. That's 57, like a lot can happen in 57 years, right? It's like another lifetime. And so Josiah, the wonder kid, has been in the public eye since he was eight, and now he's 26, and this golden boy king is finding the sweet spot of the bat. He's hitting his stride. The people are all in, and over a half century's worth of neglect is about to be resolved, removed, restored. They're going, it's going to be just like old times again. It's going to be just like David. This is going to be amazing. I can't wait. Temple, here we come. Covenant worship, we're here. But then something is about to happen that catapults this from a renovation project into something much more powerful. Scene three, verse 14. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law that the Lord had given through Moses. Now, this is the first five books of the Bible. It was on a scroll that was buried somewhere in the wall. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan, the secretary, hey, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Now, Shaphan brought the book to the king and further reported to the king, all that was committed to your servants, they are doing. They have emptied out the money that was found in the house of the Lord. They've given it to the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Hakam the son of Shaphan, Abdon the son of Micah, Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to it all that has written in this book. Can you imagine this scene? I mean, really, try to picture this. Josiah's private chamber, like half throne room, half job site trailer. There's like blueprints on the tables. There's carpenter's pencils all over the place and there's tools kind of scattered around. And then Shaphan, who's kind of like the detail-oriented accountant to this whole undertaking, comes in and he goes, hey, king, great news. Hey, the money, it's going great. Like everyone's equipped. Everyone's got what they need. They're, they're cruising along. This is great. Everyone's happy. Progress, oh, it's going awesome. They're chugging away. 
And we found this book. I'd love to know what happened between verse 18 and verse 19. They start reading the book. They start reading God's word for the first time in half a century. They start reading God's word. And you know the whole room changed. We don't know what he read. We don't know how long he read. Maybe it was Deuteronomy 17. We're talking about what a king should do. God says the king should keep the law with him so that he can do all that is recorded in it. He should read it all of his days that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. We don't know if that was it. Or maybe it was later where God said, when you come into the land, don't worship like the other nations do. We don't know what was read or how long he read it. But whatever he read, you've got to know that as Shaphan blows the dust off of this book and he opens it up, the sovereign, wise, all-knowing hand of God is moving the pages to find exactly the page that he's supposed to read to slice like a laser right to this king's heart. And as the words fall out of Shaphan's mouth and onto Josiah's ears, the implication is clear. Like, we've missed it. God, how we've missed it. Looking in the rearview mirror of his own family tree, Josiah says, my fathers did what was evil in God's sight. They missed it. And then I look at my responsibilities. I missed it, he says. And so overcome with this profound sense of personal and professional shame, Josiah grabs his collar and in the same holy rage that caused him to shatter idols out there, he mourns the idols in here and he rips it. This royal robe, this mantle of his kingship, just gone. All this cred, all this ability, all this influence that he had gathered. He realizes that any renovation out there doesn't matter unless you have renovation in here. And this stellar 26-year-old king symbol of strength for God's people, breaks in half. This is what revival looks like. This is where new starts. So what happens next? Josiah sends five servants to a prophetess. And she brings words that soften and soothe, but also compel and command. Scene four. Here's what she says. Her name is Hulda. Take a look in verse 24. Thus says the Lord. Now this is a woman in the Old Testament speaking truth to a king. Put that in your head for a minute. Verse 24. Thus says the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon This place and upon its inhabitants, all the curses that are written in the book that was read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and they've made offerings to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. Guys, forgetting God's word is a big deal. You can peripheralize a lot of things in your life Do not put this on the back burner. But then come her words for Josiah. Verse 26, But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words that you've heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God, When you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants, and you've humbled yourself before me and have torn your clothes and have wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers. You shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place and its inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. Don't miss this. Why is Josiah spared? 
It's right there, nestled in the middle, verse 27. See it? Take another look, verse 27. Because your heart was tender, you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants. You've humbled yourself before me. You've torn your clothes and you've wept. Do you know what that is? That's one word. It's repentance. Repentance. The horror of my sin should lead to humility. And true to form, it isn't long before Josiah takes decisive, courageous, and game-changing action. Scene 5, verse 29. The king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, all the people, both great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. That's Deuteronomy. And the king stood in the place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, all his soul, to perform the words of the covenant that are written in the book. And then he made all who were present in Jerusalem and in Benjamin join in it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And Josiah took away all the abominations from all the territory that belonged to the people of Israel and made all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not turn away from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. See, that's what we want. Don't you want verse 33? You only get there if you get verse 27. So that's scene five. Happy ending, right? Sort of. Let me just fast track to the end of the story. Josiah reigned for a little more than two decades, and he was killed in battle, and he was buried. He was buried with his fathers. The last truly great king. 25 years and four kings later, Judah falls to Babylon. So, what do we do with this? Right, it's kind of an uplifting look at a really dark time, but it's not enough to read this and go, huh, interesting, some more information, right? Little... Bible study rule for you, God did not give us his word so that we could be informed. God gave us his word so that we could be transformed. And so these narratives in the Old Testament, we don't just read and go, huh, cool. There's something deeper we've got to see. I want to put yourself in Josiah's throne room. I want you to put yourself in his job site trailer, whatever, for a second. Because something happens there that we need to see here. Josiah makes three choices. Three choices that lay the groundwork for revival. Three choices that are just as relevant for 2021 United States as they were for 6th century B.C. Judah. Just a heads up, these are not about you trying harder. This is not about you ratcheting down things in your life. If the gospel message was just try harder, then Jesus died for nothing. Because that's not the gospel message. Some of you know that. Because the gospel message starts with what Jesus has already done and then what I do in response out of love for him. This isn't about what you can do. So, three choices to ready yourself for revival. Ready? Here we go. Choice number one, you've got to own our sin. You've got to own our sin. I'll give you one word. Um, that separates those who are interested in revival and those who are desperate for it. Ownership. Lots of people are interested in revival. They want to see it happen. But people who are desperate for it own their sin. They own their stuff. Because here's the thing about understanding personal sin. It's always easier to see somebody else's. Isn't it? It's always easy to look over the fence and go, oh. What strikes me most about Josiah's story is what he doesn't do. It would have been so easy for him to go, guys, 
I was eight years old. Nobody told me about this book. Where were you? (laughs) Guys, how come nobody said a thing? This isn't my fault. But instead of shifting the blame, he changes the course. He says, look, I don't care how we got here. I don't care who's to blame. I don't care who's at fault. I don't have time for finger pointing. We got other stuff we got to do. I'm going to own this thing. Let's go. That's what leaders sound like. But what do we say? What do we do? What do I do? You fix your life, then I'll be okay, right? You clean up your mess so that I can have a world that's a little bit more comfortable for me. So we build this big crusade about how everybody else needs to change, and after they change, my world will be better. You fix your stuff, and then I will have a world that I like better. And some of you know Christians who live like that. Let me tell you what that is. All that is is selfishness masquerading as religious zealotry. And it sounds really spiritual, it sounds really religious because it's really intense, but it's rooted in self, and here's the giant roadblock for revival because it's rooted in a principle. You cannot be free from a sin that you won't acknowledge. There's this eternal principle about sin. Jesus talked this way. Here's what Jesus says about it, and some of you probably can know right where I'm going. Here's what Jesus said. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there's a log in your own eye? Here's Jesus says, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then, then you will be able to clearly see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. What's he mean? You must be changed before you see change. We don't like that very much. I believe one of the things that's preventing the church, not just our church, just the church, from being the dominant cultural voice it used to be, it should be, and it still can be, is that we tolerate some sins while vilifying others. We're so content to sweep some sins under the rug, but we'll take a stand against others. I'll give you an example. We're so quick to take a stand against same-sex marriage in the courts, but we're addicted to porn in our living rooms. We sing about amazing grace, and then we feel justified in our hate toward the other side. We come here and we worship a God who is great, but then we cultivate, cultivate secret pride in our heart. Church, that should not be. Sin is sin. Hell doesn't burn any hotter for sins I like less. And the church is losing her ability to speak out against sin because we've become so blind to our own. And while the world desperately needs the church to be this light on a hill, our lamp burns less brightly than it should at half wick because we just won't own it. And so Jesus' words are, before I charge out there wagging my finger, before I go smashing any idols out there, I've got to confront the idols in here. So if you want to ready yourself for revival, that's number one. Own it. And I love what Jesus says. Because he says, then you will be able to take it out of your brother's eye. Of course you see problems out there. Do you want to see your world get better? Anybody? Yeah? Jesus wants you to do that. But he wants to start here. (laughs) Then you'll be able to see clearly. (laughs) Number two, second choice. Take extreme measures when needed. Let's get right back to Josiah. Josiah is a 26-year-old king. That in and of itself is hugely significant. It brings a ton of insecurity. He always has people looking over his shoulder, always people who could suggest how to do things better. He's an impressionable young leader facing an impossible task. And then they find this book And Shaphan blows the dust off. Josiah hears it. He's convicted. And when he walks out of that throne room with his robe torn from top to bottom, all of his kingship, this mantle that he wears, little threads of fabric blowing in the empty silence, it's not a far stretch to imagine people looking at him going, dude, what happened in there? Here's the principle. Revival only comes when you care more about what's right than your reputation. Hmm. Josiah had a ton to lose, but he cared more about 
how he stood before God than how he looked among men. When habit takes a back seat to holiness, where I give up what I want and what I enjoy for what I really, really need. Jesus talked this way too. Here's what he said. This is Matthew 5, verse 29. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. Strong language, Jesus. Or if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body get thrown into hell. What's he saying? Here's the question. He's not telling you to literally do any of that. He's speaking hyperbolically, okay? But what is, what's he saying? Here's the question underneath that. What if the freedoms that I enjoy are preventing me from the revival that I need? What if the freedoms that I enjoy are preventing me from the revival that I need? Let me get specific so you know what I'm talking about. It's not a sin to have a glass of wine with your dinner. But God's word says that getting drunk is clearly beneath God's plan for you. So what if, in order to prevent that from happening, I need to forego this privilege? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to forego that freedom so that this does not become true of you? It's not a sin to watch whatever movie within limits. But what if in watching that movie you see a scene that inflames something in your heart and it causes you to look at your marriage or your singleness differently? Are you willing to forego that freedom which is yours so that that other thing does not become true of you? Are you willing to give that up? It's not a sin to have apps on your phone and to spend time in investing that influence in social media, but what if, in the course of exercising that freedom, you find that your life is filled with anxiety? Are you willing to forego that freedom so that this thing does not become true of you? That's what Jesus is talking about. Gouge out your eye. Cut off your hand. Give up the freedom that you enjoy for the revival that you need. Do whatever it takes. Remove whatever freedom you need to to keep you away from sin. And we got to be clear about something here. Because you're going to look weird if you do this. Right? If you saw a guy walking around with one eye and one hand, you'd go, something happened there. <laughs> There's a story behind that. Okay, so if you start to remove freedoms from your life that everybody else enjoys, you're going to look weird. You're going to be noticeable. And it's not going to be great for you. You're going to be giving up things. But in a world where 70% of men view pornography once a month, binge drinking, marital unfaithfulness, and suicidal thoughts are on the rise, guys, I don't want normal. Like, normal is not okay with me. I want better. I want to be more than I can be on my own. Normal people don't change their world. Weird people do. So let me ask that question again. What if the freedoms that you enjoy are preventing you from the revival that you need? Now, here's my promise to you in case you're feeling pinched right now, because I am, and I wrote this. You can never give something up that God will not replace with himself. You will never give up a pleasure that God won't replace with himself. Cannot happen. Our God is too good, and he loves you too much to leave you unsatisfied when you seek him. Test him in that. So that's number two. Take extreme measures when needed. Number three, and this comes right out of Josiah, break the cycles. Here's what this means. Josiah had a pretty tattered family history, right? Grandpa, king, sacrificed two of his sons to please a pagan god. His dad, same deal. On paper, these are not the makings of a great leader. This is a pretty hopeless story. If this was 21st century America, you can pretty well plot the trajectory of where Josiah's life is going to end up, right? Some of you need to hear this. Some of you have inherited a mess, okay? You've got family stories. You've got things in your past. You've got behaviors. You've got attitudes that you have learned either from your parents or from your grandparents, either directly or indirectly. There are cycles in your life that are preventing you and they're attacking your spiritual life in a detrimental way, right? And they set you up in such a way spiritually that you feel like you're always playing catch up to everybody else. And the best news I can have for you this morning is Jesus can make you free. 
Jesus can break what? There's no cycle he can't break. Some of them are really hard. But Jesus can make you free. You have a hard road ahead of you, but you can be the one that says, Jesus, it's you and me. Let's break this thing. Here's the good news of the gospel. The gospel is not what you've inherited. You are not what you've inherited. You're not your parents' sin. You're not even your sin. In the cross, you are not defined by what happened to you, before you, or around you. You are defined in the cross by what Jesus says about you and what he can do through you. It's a new day. Jesus offers forgiveness and cleansing and healing and newness and unconditional love through the cross. And so if you're struggling with cycles of generational sin, your first step is the cross. Your first step is salvation. Do you know Jesus? That is the most important question. You've got a super tough road ahead of you, and it starts at the cross. The gospel is not about how bad I've messed things up. The gospel is about how a good God rescues, redeems, restores, and rebuilds broken people. So if you're the first in your family to trust Jesus, let me give you a few quick tips to stop those cycles. Number one, get straight with Jesus. He can heal you, but you got to make him yours. Nobody inherits Jesus. Second thing, you need to get in community. You know you've got a battle in front of you, and I don't want you to do it alone. Third thing, you need to normalize help. Ask for help. Some of this stuff is really deep. And here at North Canton Chapel, we have partners or partnerships with organizations that are trained to help you work through that stuff. Don't go it alone. So that's number three, break the cycles. As a close, I want to I go back to Josiah's story real quick. I told you that Josiah was like the last great king. It's not really true. It's kind of true. God's people waited 500 years without a king. So one day, another king was born, this time to a young couple who were seeking shelter in a stable in a backwater called Bethlehem. And this king would grow up with the sole purpose to bring dead things back to life, to change the normal To not give us normal, but to give us better. Something we could never dream of. And my only question this morning is, do you know him? Because that's where revival starts. Do you know him? Today could be the day. Why not make him yours? What are you waiting for? He loves you. And in his dying, he shows you God's undying love. Let me pray. Father, we are powerless to please you. We know that. On our own, God, we bring nothing but empty rags, filthy things. But God, we want to say that we love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the cross where all of our hope is. And it's not us earning our way back to you, but it is what Christ has done for us out of your love for us. Father, we just want to say that we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.